Hi there. Welcome to the first of my new series of book repair videos. I'm going to be going over the next oh, 16 weeks through a complete set, 26 volumes, of the Illustrated Library Edition of Dickens's works published in the 1860s. I just bought these online, I've just received them, and I'm about to start work on the first two volumes in the set. Here they are, the Pickwick Papers. These were issued in 1861 in this uh, red cloth. What I'm going to do first of all is just show you the work that needs doing on them and then I'll get on with it. Okay, so we've got two volumes here. Volume one, let's open it up. Oh dear, split down uh, the spine here and the mole showing. This has got to be re-glued clearly. Lots of pages hanging out. Yeah, oh, it's, uh, it's disintegrated. Yeah, so I've got to I've got to break the spine effectively down here and uh, reback it. Uh, it's very dirty. It's also look, it's been glued down. People who don't know anything about book repairs should not attempt them. This is not how books were made. It's not how they're meant to re be repaired. So the first thing I'm going to do is undo this terrible piece of book repair. Let's have a look at volume two. Well, look at that. Totally disintegrated. Holes in the spine. Um, the entire book block has come away from the mull. It's badly dog-eared. It's filthy. It's a wreck. Okay, so that's, um, that's plenty of work, I would say, for me to be getting on with. I would estimate this is about two or three hours work for me. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video now. First thing I'm going to do is clean these and I'm going to go outside to do this because these will produce a lot of dust and you don't want to be breathing in 150 year old, 160 year old book dust. It's not good for the lungs. Okay, see you in a bit. I've just cleaned the head of one volume. You can't see my head. Here it is though. Uh, Look at the difference between these. This is just with a toothbrush, okay? So don't throw away your old toothbrushes. They can be useful for book repair. Look, this one I've just cleaned with a toothbrush. This is what it looked like. This is its pair. You see how much dirt has come off just with a uh, little brushing. I've got both volumes nicely cleaned. It's better be working on a, you know, a clean old book rather than a dirty old book. Um, but before I start work, let me show you the materials that I'm going to use. Nothing very elaborate. If you watch my earlier video on repairing a Pickwick first edition, you'll know that I don't use anything very sophisticated. So my tools are a toothbrush, a selection of sharp and blunt craft knives, a bone folder, a pair of scissors, erasers, archival tape, resist tape, PVA glue, book cloth cleaner, clean rags, a toothbrush and water. And this is the cloth that I'm going to use to repair these books. So I have a piece of another volume from an illustrated library, from the illustrated library edition. Okay. And some odd bits and pieces that I've saved from previous repair jobs on similar volumes plus a selection of other red cloth that I can use when it's not going to be visible. So I'll need to uh, restore the spine, possibly even some corners, and I'll use different shades of red as and when. But mostly where it's visible, I'll try and use the original pattern cloth. Okay, so those are the materials that I'm going to use. Let's get down to work on volume one. And volume one, even though it doesn't look quite as bad as volume two, is actually probably more work because the first thing I've got to do is undo the bad repair job which has been done on the spine. Somebody has just taken completely inappropriate glue, slapped it on the inside of the spine and stuck it down to the text block and I've got to undo that so that I can then reconstruct the book as a book should be made. First thing I have to do 
it's bound on strings which I've got a slit I don't like doing this but I'm gonna to have to reback this so I just slit through the strings here there's not much holding this together and see how much I can part this with my fingers or with a little pressure from a craft knife to separate the text block from the remnants of the spine. Something about this edition, even though it was meant to be, well it was an expensive edition, these were seven shillings and sixpence each volume, so 15 shillings for the two volume set. Even though they were expensive and kind of a luxury item, they were extremely badly made. Um, so the cloth is nice, but the other materials used were not up to scratch. Um, so the, the mull or the gauze, um, which was put on the uh, spines and then joined the text block to the um, covers, was too thin and too fragile. And the principal problem was the glue that was used. It was gutta percha glue, which over time crystallised, completely dried out, and the books fell to pieces. So there are very few copies of the first issue of the Illustrated Library Edition in decent state, okay, in decent condition. Most of them have fallen to pieces. And uh, so this is why I'm having to do such repair jobs because they weren't very well made in the first place. Okay, so I've got, um, I've got half the text block off and I'm gonna have to slit Oh, well, it's just come apart. So it's just come off. Well, that's quite nice, actually. Look, see this, most of it I can remove with my fingers because the glue has virtually got no sticking power anymore. This is the original glue. What the, um, what the would-be repairer has done has stuck, they've stuck this, to the inside of the spine. That's what I've got to remove. Let me give you a bit of background to the Illustrated Library Edition. It started life in 1858 as simply the Library Edition. This was proposed to Dickens by John Forster who felt that his work was now substantial enough and established enough to be issued in a library format to make Dickens one of the established greats, one of the classics like Defoe or Fielding, or Richardson, or Scott. So the library edition was meant to give him a higher status and preserve his work for posterity. So uh, the, the deal was agreed between Dickens's two principal publishers, that was Chapman and Hall and Bradbury and Evans, that all of his major works to date would be issued either in one or two volumes at monthly intervals and in a uniform format in 22 volumes. 11 of them would be actually issued by Chapman and Hall and the second 11 by Bradbury and Evans, although both publishers' names would appear on the title page. So they say published by Chapman and Hall and Bradbury and Evans on all 22 volumes, regardless of who was the actual publisher. And the first 11 were Chapman and Hall, the second 11 were Bradbury and Evans. Well, after about 20 minutes of careful scratching and scraping, I've removed just about all the paper lining to the spine that was clinging to it. You'll see that there are some remnants still there. That's because of the design on the other side. It's very difficult to get it out of those intricate features of the design. But what's left seems quite content to stay there. So I'll be able to glue a new internal spine, a reinforcing spine, onto this in the fullness of time. So I'm going to leave this bit, the case, for a little while and then uh, get to work on the text block, see what I have to do to that. Principally, I've just got to remove the rest of the, um, the mull and the card here and, uh, and re-glue the sections that are loose. Right, so the text block is now nice and clean. What I'm going to do is find those sections which are loose and, oh dear, 
Yeah. And just put a fillet of glue down the spine here to secure it. And then I'm going to put new backing on and that will hold it securely in place. I'm not going to re-sew. I don't think it's necessary. There are just a couple of loose sections. Okay, three, I think. Uh-huh. Right. Okay, you can see where this section has been sticking out. It's dirty along the edge because it's been proud of the rest of the text block. So I just run along here with an eraser and it will remove that dirt so that when it's reinserted and it's at the same level as the rest of the text block, you won't even notice that it was once sticking out. And for this edition, it was decided that there would simply be a title vignette by H.K. Uh, Brown, by Fizz, for most of the volumes. In fact, there's one, vol one uh, novel, Little Dorrit, which um, is illustrated by Frith. But basically, the only illustrations would be these newly commissioned vignettes by Fizz. And the books were meant to look serious. So they're in this fairly dull, grey-green, mucky-looking binding. Nothing very spectacular whatsoever. And they were issued at six shillings a volume at monthly intervals. Chapman and Hall started the process off with the Pickwick Papers and they printed 4,000 copies of each volume. For the rest of the series, they reduced that to 2,000 copies, thinking, oh, Pickwick is going to be the most popular because it's Dickens's most famous, most successful novel. There's bound to be a big demand for that. So Pickwick is unusual in that there was twice the print run for that that there was for any of the others. OK, there we have the sections of the text block glued back together. They're going to be secured by some better quality mull, some craft paper, and, uh, and with that they'll be re-secured in the case. OK, I'm going to leave this for a while and uh, turn my attention once again to the case. What have we got to do to this? Well, as you can see, most of the spine is there, but there are a few holes in it. I can see through it from this side. Um, there are some pieces missing at the top here, and it's a bit ragged down here, and there are some slits in the cloth. So what I'm going to do is put a new backing piece all the way down the spine, and what I'm going to do is slit internally here, slit inside the front and the back covers so that I can insert the uh, replacement piece of cloth in here. However, the entire project was a failure. Why, you may ask? Well, I've thought about this quite a lot and I think the principal reason is that they hadn't done any market research. They hadn't realised that the illustrations were a major, major part of Dickens's appeal. That Fizz's illustrations, largely Fizz, some of them of course are Crookshank as well, Seymour, etc. Um, but the illustrations really were an integral part of Dickens's success. And to issue these books thinking, oh, well, they'll go into libraries and, and people who have libraries, they don't really need the pictures. These are educated people. They don't need the pictures to help them tell the story. Actually, they wanted the pictures. And so even though there was a fairly modest print run for this uh, set, they couldn't sell them. And after two years of failing to shift their stock, um, both publishers, Chapman and Hall and Bradbury and Evans, were left with masses of unsold stock. Neither publisher dared to tell Dickens that they'd actually made a loss on producing this series, and they managed to camouflage that in their accounts to Dickens by giving, you know, pluses from other editions that had been sold. But actually, on this entire set, the library edition, 
the publishers and Dickens made a net loss. It was the only time in Dickens' career that, this, that, that something like this fell completely flat. Okay, what I've done is I've made a slit about a quarter of an inch to a centimetre inside each side of the spine down uh, into the covers. So what this means is that I'll be able to insert from the inside a piece of cloth that will go to here on each of the covers and then inside the spine. Reinforce it and I'm going to use identical cloth to repair the ends where it's visible and slightly different cloth because I haven't got much of it um, for the parts that won't show. Okay, that's going to take a long time. There was a, a bold decision taken by Frederick Chapman of Chapman and Hall to relaunch the library edition as the illustrated library edition by including all the original illustrations from the first editions. And what he did was he took all the unsold stock from the warehouse and rejigged it, repurposed it, recased it. So a lot of these wouldn't have been bound up. They'd still have been in what's called choirs, just in the sections. So they wouldn't actually have to have been taken out of the binding, although I suspect some of them were. Just the, the bindings were stripped off and they were, uh, uh, and they were recased. But the principal job that they had to do was to print new title pages, print list of illustrations, and print new plates for insertion in the text blocks. And so they ripped out the title pages, stuck in a new title page, stuck in a list of illustrations, and tipped in all the illustrations, and then rebound the books, or bound them for the first time, in this new binding, red cloth, gilt lettering, quite smart, and instead of issuing them at six shillings a volume, they were seven and sixpence this time. And lo and behold, it was a success. Now, it wasn't a huge success initially, and they didn't print very many copies. In fact, what we're dealing with, and I'll explain this as we go along when we're looking at each volume one by one, the publishers repurposed copies from the library edition to make them now the illustrated library edition and supplemented them with some additional texts that they printed up to give a reasonable number to put on the market. But the numbers varied from volume to volume, depending on how many they had in stock from the library edition and how the series was going and whether they had any orders coming in from America, which is also a factor in the, in the whole situation. Because even though these were principally destined for the domestic market, quite a number of them went abroad as well and were issued by overseas publishers, sometimes with modified title pages, but that's a very complicated story. Anyway, Pickwick Papers was the first in the series of the Illustrated Library Edition, and they had roughly 1,500 sets of the 4,000 still in stock when they decided to relaunch the series in 1861. They supplemented this with a thousand copies that they printed of volume one and 750 copies of volume two. And what we've got here, what I'm repairing at the moment, is one of those thousand or 750 copies that Chapman and Hall printed off after they decided to, uh, to launch the Illustrated Library Edition. And you can tell the difference because in those copies that were repurposed, at the beginning of 1861, both publishers' names still appear on the title page. So it says Chapman and Hall, Bradbury and Evans. On the newly printed copies, even though they're dated 1861, just like the, the other ones, it only names Chapman and Hall. The reason for this is that during 1861, Dickens and Chapman and Hall, between them, bought up the copyright to all of Dickens's back catalogue from Bradbury and Evans. 
So from the middle of 1861, Dickens effectively, in collaboration with his publishers Chapman and Hall, owned the rights to all his books. And now they no longer needed to put Bradbury and Evans on the title page because they had no financial, commercial, uh, copyright interest in the matter anymore. Dickens had severed his relations with uh, Bradbury and Evans, set up all the year round and was back as a Chapman and Hall author. And from then on, from the middle of 1861, Chapman and Hall could reissue the entire set of the library edition now as the illustrated library edition. Okay, I hope that's clear. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there. See you in a bit.